so this actually ties in very well with Matt's talk right now, just now about on-chain versus off-chain architecture. This kind of helps solve the UX issues and mention some points he talked about. So hi, I'm Jeffrey. I'm a blockchain consultant. I work on a lot of smart contract stuff. So I spend my time thinking about how to architect it, how to improve the UX, UI, and also what the future of the entire crypto space will look like. It's my Twitter. So first of all, Ethereum is pretty young. This kind of contradicts a lot of what Amber Dale said, but there's very few active main dApps on the mainnet, less than 700 to be exact. And even less of those have more than one user a day using it. And secondly, smart contract is evolving constantly. Uh, as you know, there's more patterns, more designs being outputted every single day. There are things like gas tokens, there are things like uh, TCRs, and proxy contracts are being brought out every single day. Apart from that, Solidity's language is constantly evolving. Solidity 0.5 has the compiler completely regutted. And there's new languages like Viper and Bamboo that's coming out that we can utilize as well. Last thing is, I think new developers come into space and to kind of realize that Web3 is not the same as Web2. The way we need to think about how data is stored and how computation is done needs to be completely rethought. So, oops. What is off-chain? There's many different components to this. There are two solutions I'm sure you guys heard a lot about, so I'm not gonna get into it. But there's stuff like L4, Plasma, and TrueBit that kind of solves that. And we have centralized solutions, right? Like AWS and Google App Engine kind of tells you, basically you have control over the server and can run whatever computation you want on there. And lastly, we have Oracles, which kind of connect the centralized server with the decentralized smart contracts. It allows smart contracts to request data from any off-chain source. So these are the three main factors I want to talk about when considering when you design when you design workflow or a particular function. And to think about the cost, not in terms of gas, but how important is this function or is this data? Speed, how fast do we need this? And lastly, quantity, how much or how how much do we of this data do we have? Um, this kind of splits up into two main categories. I think everything in a smart contract either falls into computation or storage. So let's cover computation first. Using the three categories we talked about before. Cost, how valuable is this result? Is this, using a real life example, is it like buying a house? Or is it like click tracking? Buying a house is a huge transaction that we need to think about and make sure it's totally correct and verifiable. Whereas click tracking is something that happens so frequently, maybe a million times a day, that if we lose a data point, if, some, if we forget to add one, that's totally okay, as long as we get the general result at the end. And second to think about is, can we even do this on chain? Um, there's a Ethereum glass block gas limit, so there's only so much stuff we can do on chain. So maybe some stuff we have to use off chain services to solve at the current state. Secondly, speed. How fast do we need this, do we need this result? This go back to, goes back to a lot of what Matt said with regards to user experience. If I'm playing like a game, I'm not, I don't want to wait there for uh, 12 seconds for my character to move one space, right? I want this to be instantaneous, where else there's no way people will use Ethereum. Versus publishing a tweet, as long as you publish a tweet, as long as the tweet is out there eventually, you're okay with it, you don't really care that it needs to appear in the next second. Lastly is quantity. So how often are we really doing this computation? Something like changing your dress versus uh, making moving chess. You're not gonna change your dress every single day, it's probably gonna be once every year, once every two years, so on and so forth. Whereas making a chess will take the maximum of an hour, if you're really pro. Um, so these are kind of things to consider when, you're thinking about, when you think about doing a computation on chain. Should, does this belong on chain? If it belongs off chain, what could we do? So here are some solutions. There are two, of course, state channels, TrueBit, Plasma. I won't get into that. That's a whole other thing that's being developed. But uh, I think it's mostly solved by now because a lot of these things are in production and we're able to use it. Hopefully more of them soon. Another thing is off-chain computation for the less valuable results. This is similar to what I mentioned about um, click tracking. If it's something like a simple click, maybe we don't need to do, every time someone, so, someone clicks, we need to do a request on chain, kind of aggregate the data and put the final result on chain as long as we can verify it. Last, last thing is the uh, on-chain proof of off-chain computation. So this can mean many different things. It's kind of similar to say channels, but as long as we have a hash maybe of our algorithm that we're calculating with, someone else should be able to come and challenge 
our result at any point. Uh, another concept around this is if you imagine a order list, we have a group of data. We can actually order this data off chain and on chain as long as we're able to verify that every number after is larger than the number before, that's totally okay, right? People are, will be able to trust you that way. So next, let's talk about storage. Uh, same three core concepts. Cost, how important is data we're storing? Similarly, ID versus data leaderboard. I once worked on a DAP before where the product manager really, really cared about having every single action the user made, every single like small transaction being on chain, which basically meant that DAP was completely unusable because you just sit there and wait and click on MetaMask confirmations constantly to do anything. Uh, whereas like something like an ID should be always, there should always be a source of truth that people can go to and check out. Speed, how often are we reading or writing this data? Reading doesn't matter as much because you're mainly, in most cases, just hitting if you're a node, whereas writing is a lot more ex expensive and you don't want to overflow the Ethereum network with that. So a simple example here is the Ethereum price versus something like terms of service. The Ethereum price is gonna update constantly, so you, all, so you don't want to hit the chain that much for that, whereas TOS is something that's gonna be there constantly and doesn't change as much. Lastly, uh, quantity. How much data are we storing here? Again, something like add data versus country names, there's set amount of countries, and that's not gonna expand much more in the future. Whereas add data, we have a, a lot of it, and we're gonna get more every single day, and they're not as valuable, so they can be deprecated as we go on. And some other factors to consider is immutability and lifespan of your data. Most data on your theme chain is immutable. You have a track record of what that looks like, and lifespan could be forever if you wanna keep it there. Uh, so how do we solve this with some off-chain solutions? First of all, I think Matt mentioned this well, is offline, offline caching for on-chain results. A great example of this is for TCRs, when users come and look at a voting process, maybe they don't need the most up-to-date voted votes, but as long as they have a general idea of which side is winning, which side is losing, they can submit their vote without looking at other people's votes. So if that's a little bit stale, that's totally okay. But we should always have a way for users to come and challenge the results right now if they want an on-chain update of that. Second is batch updates. Uh, this is another interesting concept. Back to this ad example, imagine there's a lot of clicks coming through. We don't want to hit the chain for every single one. But if we're able to take maybe 100 of these and put it into array or some sort of data structure and push that at once, we offload a lot of work of, off uh, the Ethereum network onto our servers. Uh, another thing I like to call proof of existence, which right now is implemented mostly as an IPFS hash. A lot of people are doing this right now. Instead of storing like a JSON object on chain, you store the hash to a IPFS address that people can go and retrieve the JSON object. So what you actually lose out here is other contracts can't get this data on chain, which means you have to really consider, do other contracts want this data or is it just for my contract only or it doesn't really matter. Stuff like Xerox orders, other contracts want to be able to leverage that, so maybe there's some data you want to change. Lastly is the relayer technique. So Xerox does a really good job of this, and there's a lot of other companies coming out that are employ employing the same kind of tactic. What this means is users can create the data off-chain, and they actually don't need any sort of like co computer at all. Technically, you can sign it into the hashing yourself. But on-chain, you have an algorithm that kind of makes sure this is a proper data set, and you're and this data does work with the system and is signed by both sides, right? So this is like a really great technique. Uh, here, this is a generalized table about storage as a whole, looking at Ethereum, IPFS, and S3, but could be anything else. If we wanna look at immutability, eternal, decentralized speed, and cost. So for Ethereum, of course, we have all of those. It's, it's immutable, it's eternal, and it's decentralized, but it is slow, as I mentioned, and the cost is high relative to the rest of these. IPFS, immutable, yes. Eternal, not so much right now. Um, the nodes can actually like, delete how much of the data they want so they can delete some of those, but this might change the future and there's a bunch of other protocols working on this, so it's questionable. Uh, decentralized, yes. Speed, it's much better than, the, than uh, hitting something on chain but not as fast as a centralized solution. Cost is low right now. We don't know how this will look like when, once Filecoin and all these other protocols come out. Now lastly, S3, it is immutable? Not really. If you link someone to an address, you can change the content in there anytime you want. 
eternal, it could be if you have enough money to just keep running it, but it's up to Amazon to shut, shut you off if they want to, right? Uh, decentralized, not at all. All this da data belongs to Amazon at the end of the day. Speed, um, this will be much faster. You can be hitting like a Redis cache or any sort to get your data retrieval. So it's much faster than anything else here. Cost is relatively low compared to the rest of these. And that's pretty much it. But before I go, I want to make two more points. Uh, first, shout out to Stan James, who kind of helped me work on a lot of these ideas. Secondly, I want to enforce the fact that these are just general concepts here. So the idea of speed, cost, and quantity is just general ideas. And these solutions are not definite. People work on these every single day. So what we should do is kind of internalize some of these ideas and figure out how we can make new solutions to these problems and help evolve Ethereum forward in that direction. Thanks, guys.